The 12A Podcast presents Film History. It's time for This Week in Film History. All right, so we have a good story for you today. All right. So sometimes in these you sort of get good tidbits, facts, if you will, that you didn't know about early film history, stuff like that. Sometimes you get a really good story. This is all of it, okay? Especially really good story. In fact, this is two good stories because we're celebrating the... Uh, uh, this week was the anniversary of the death of uh, Thomas H. Eintz, who was a, a film producer back in the early teens and 20s. Okay, and so uh, we have his life and death, and those are two really good stories. His life is a good story. Mm -hmm. His death is an even better story. What? Yes. There's, that was my sound effect for you. What? Yes, good sound effect. There's mystery. <laughs> there's intrigue. There's <laughs> romance. Right? There's huh. adventure. There's excitement. Okay, here we go. So it's in the early, early days of, of filmmaking, and lots of people are carrying over from vaudeville into the kind of film world, and that's where Thomas Ince grew up. So he's trying to make it as, as an actor and he's making five dollars a day he's married he's trying to you know just make it on his own it, very difficult and he's doing a terrible job but finally one of his friends gives him an opportunity to be a director now <clears throat> i don't know if you remember i think it was <clears throat> i don't remember his last podcast or the one before that we we started talking about um uh, Thomas Edison and his mm -hmm. effect on filmmaking. Right. And I alluded to the fact that he uh, started this thing called the Motion Picture Patent Company where they tried to monopolize filmmaking at that time because they had patents on a lot of the filmmaking stuff. And he actually partnered with other people who had patents that he didn't have. And, <clears throat> and so they tried to squash all of the independent filmmaking because they wanted everybody to pay sort of royalties and fees to him for you know, for using this stuff for the projectors and for the filmmaking. And uh, the worst of it was, well, uh, I won't say the worst of it, but Eastman Kodak was making the film and he had uh, a sort of monopoly on the film. And then um, uh, uh, they also had uh, patents on the projectors and stuff like that. So one of the ways they, uh, the independent film studios that were trying to uh, uh, exist outside of that monopoly was they would bring in foreign films. So, and this is easier to do because remember, this is still the silent era. So right, it's, it's right. easier to bring in foreign films and have it translate. Mm -hmm. So what they, they started to get more and more clever and creative. So what they started to do is, and this is what happened with Thomas Eintz, uh, they took directors and they sent them with a crew down to Cuba and they would make their movie in Cuba where the patents didn't exist, and then they would ship the movie back to the United States for distribution. Oh. So they were trying to skirt the issues around that way. Okay. So, um, okay, so now that's part of it. Now, Hollywood, you know, uh, one of the big questions that's usually asked in film history is why Hollywood? Why, how did it happen out there? Film industry actually didn't start in Hollywood. Film industry started in, um, in New York, uh, you know that's that's closer to where Thomas Edison stuff was at, and um, actually all the early film studios and stuff um, were based out of New York, and they'd go uh, across the street or across the river to uh, New Jersey, and most of their filming would be done in New Jersey. There's a lot of great locations and stuff like that. Huh. So, uh, a part of all this motion picture patent company cracking down, and um, what they would do is if a theater was in violation, they would sue them you know, and uh, bring all these lawsuits with them. And so they didn't have to do a lot of enforcement. They actually had the police to do all this enforcement for them. But the problem was, was even though that was working, it took a lot of time. So they didn't always want to use that route because it took too long to go through the legal court. So when that wasn't going to work, they had their own thugs that would go in and break up movie theaters and bust them up and break them down like total like gang the mafia gangster style. Yeah. Total ah. gangster style. Right. So tear it up. So this was like, cause like it was, it, they actually, in all honesty, they did a lot of good things in terms of making the uh, film between production and distribution. They, a, a lot of, um, uh, efficiency stuff and uh, stuff like that. They actually did a lot of good things there because they had that monopoly. But the independent scene and stuff like, like they were they were crushing it, and obviously they were being very unethical about a lot of things. So Hollywood sort of came out of that environment where they were trying to get away from that. 
So they wanted to get away from New Jersey where all this stuff was happening. And part of the reason they picked um, uh, California was because of the landscape. It was very, uh, uh, there was a great variety. The climate was great year round. Um, they, you know, they had the ocean right there. They had, uh, uh, it, uh, things were building up out there. Um, actually some, I know at least one filmmaker in particular stopped in Flagstaff, Arizona, and that could have been the next Hollywood, but wow. he decided he would, ah, why don't I see what's a little bit further down? The end? So, he, yeah. huh. so anyways, so they ended up in California, you know, like I said, great, uh, environment for filming, uh, just excellent year round, uh, great locations. Uh, but the big thing too is, um, they got away from New Jersey and even though these were federal patents that they were that they had, uh, the Ninth Circuit of Appeals Court, which was uh, based in San Francisco, had no interest in enforcing these stupid patents in New Jersey. So these people, these filmmakers, would go down there and they'd make their films in uh, California, and they pretty much started to get around that issue until the patents expired and the government broke up the monopoly. So. Backtracking to Thomas Eintz, okay, so he's doing this thing in Cuba, so he goes to, and this is total straight out of like, uh, what was that movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can, okay. so yeah. he goes to he, he goes to this film uh, production company, and, he, and uh, he's too poor, uh, so he borrows a suit and goes to the uh, company and says, I'm a big shot director. Obviously, I'm very successful. I'm good at what I do. Uh, pay me to go out to California, and I'll do this for you. Uh, I'll, I'll set up stuff. I'm going to make you some good movies. They're so like, oh, obviously, he knows what he's doing. So, uh, so they they pay him. Remember, as an actor, he was making $5 a day. They paid him 150 to go out to California. Whoa. Yeah. So he goes out to California, and he is really – the author of sort of what the producer mogul and what the uh, eventually the studio system turned out to be. He was the one who sort of patented all that. And as a side note, he sort of invented the Western genre. Now remember the Western genre is the one genre that's unique to America, right? So comedy, drama, romance, action, thriller, that stuff's been forever. I mean, we can trace it back to the Greeks, but it's been around for longer than that right mm -hmm. so the western is the one genre uniquely american made for americans because outside of america the genre the western really wasn't you know they didn't really have the western era that we had right right yeah, yeah. so so it, he became sort of the father of westerns he became the father of the the the, the sort of mogul and what he really did because back then you sort of had the the writer slash director slash editor slash, you know, sort of the, you know, film school student, right? So he was the first one to sort of pull all those things apart and sort of invent the role of the producer who sort of oversaw all these different components working together. And, and he was one of the first guys to sort of build a studio around this uh, uh, compartmentalized business and make those parts work in, and together in harmony to make movies huh. an assembly line for movies uh yeah that's exactly much. what it was ah. he invented the assembly line for movies that's ah. exactly it that's that's actually the word that a lot of people use from okay so uh he goes on and uh his his, his his career sort of evolves from there and and some different interesting things happen but for the sake of time which uh this is already like i told you gonna be long uh now we get to the death the death is more interesting than his life. And yes. for me, his life was really interesting. <laughs> okay, so this is his death. And let me just start off by telling you the story that is the official account of what happened. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so it's like the official, what the right. world knows, the uh, papers, whatever. This okay. is kind of, yeah. So <clears throat> um, do you know who Wend William, Randall, William Randolph Hearst was? Uh, uh, newspaper tycoon, right? Guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy mm -hmm. who's kind of lampooned in uh, Citizen Kane and mm -hmm. just um, extremely rich man, <laughs> extremely rich and um, just crazy powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he does business with Eins, and he is throwing a uh, yacht uh, party for Eins on his big fancy yacht, and uh, Eins is actually late to his own party because he is finishing up a deal with Hearst's company 
ironically. Okay. So he catches a train <laughs> and catches up with the yacht. It's gone down the coast a bit. Okay, so he goes to this party. He catches up with them Sunday night. Okay. And he starts to have indigestion problems. We do know that he's had some problems with ulcers in the past. and um, But he has a really acute problem with, quote, indigestion okay okay he is taken off the boat because he's getting so sick by a, a doctor dr robertson or i'll have to look that up uh by by this guy who is uh dr goodman that's it his name's dr goodman right dr goodman takes him off the boat he is not doing well he gets them on a train they're going to start heading home uh the situation appears to worsen and he's afraid that it's not just indigestion. He's afraid that it's a heart condition. So they hop off the train. They get a hotel room. They stay for the night. They call in another doctor or nurse to come take a look at him. They let him know what's going on. They call in his wife from um, from Culver City. She comes down and joins them. Uh, then they hop back on the train. They get back to Eins's home where he is uh, cared for by his personal physician, and his per personal physician then pronounces him dead, and the reason he lists is heart failure. The next day, the Hearst uh, newspaper uh, mourns the loss of Eins, talks about his accomplishments, and says that he died with his family, and then scatters some other things about the death that are obviously wrong. Hmm. Okay. And here's where it starts to get interesting. All right. The Los Angeles Times, their morning edition newspaper, says that Eins was shot dead. What? And in their evening uh, reprint of the newspaper, the headline is gone. Really? Yes. So the Los Angeles Times, which is not owned by Hearst, right. prints that he is shot dead. Yes. And then later omits it from their evening newspaper. Oh, okay, so what's the understory? So there are several different ideas about what happened, but nobody really knows. What? Because here's what happens after he dies. His wife cremates the body immediately and goes on a trip to Europe. What? And Hearst takes good care of her for the rest of her life, gives her a bunch of money to take good care of her for the rest of her life without... You know, her husband supporting income, which was a much bigger deal back then. Right. <clears throat> okay. So interesting, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's backtrack. Seeing cover up here. <laughs> right. So let's okay. backtrack. There's right. a lot of interesting stories. All right. Here's what we know about some of the people on the boat. Dr. Goodman, who took care of him, was a, a, a licensed physician, but he wasn't a practicing doctor. He was actually an employee at the Hearst, under the Hearst umbrella. He was a Hearst employee. He wasn't a practicing physician. Okay, and he was the guy who took him off the boat and took him home and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting fact number two. Number number two, <clears throat> there was a movie uh, uh, like review reporter. So there was a reporter on the boat who worked for the New York Times. But after this, she quit the New York Times and or it was around this time and took a uh, lifetime deal with uh, the Hearst Company and took a big promotion, big pay raise, became pretty successful with what she did right okay. interesting fact again okay now here's two other people that were on the boat it was uh charlie chaplin who you've heard of correct yes yes i know who this guy is and the other person was uh marion um ah shoot let me see Marion, uh, I can't remember her last name, but it was uh, her. It was it was Hearst's mistress. Oh, okay. Right. Hearst, Hearst, okay. Hearst okay. had Hearst had this uh, mistress, uh, Marion Davies. That's what it was. Uh, so he had this mistress. He, he he was married, but he was like separated from her, and she wouldn't divorce him. And he had all this money, so they never got divorced because it would have been really messy. And it's a long story. But anyways, he had this mistress who he was like obsessed with, mm -hmm. and he was afraid that she was fooling around with Charlie Chaplin. So the rumor is is that he had Charlie Chaplin on the boat because he wanted to keep an eye on him and make sure there wasn't anything going on between him and his mistress. Oh, right. So there's three conspiracies. Or, or there's three theories about what happened on that boat, and two of them have to do with uh, that love triangle. One of them is that Hearst got upset, and he um, uh, he caught uh, the two of them, uh, Chaplin and Davies, in uh, a compromising position, 
and uh, grabbed his gun. There was a screaming match that ensued. Uh, people came out, and Eins actually took a bullet for Chaplin. <clears throat> so he was shot. In fact, there's even Chaplin's assistant. Uh, Chaplin's statement is really varied on the record because his his assistant actually said that she saw Eins with a bullet wound to the head once he got off the boat with Goodman, but later retracted that. And then Chaplin's statements about how he found out about what happened. He said he didn't find out for two weeks, but we know that he was at the funeral uh, that Friday, and we know that he died two days later, so he wouldn't have seen him later that week. So it's really weird. All right, so that's one theory that Hearst shot him while uh, trying to shoot Chaplin. Another theory was that, again, Hearst caught Chaplin and Davies in a compromising position, uh, but he... Uh, it, he didn't really assess the situation and he, and he shot Chaplin, but he, it, it turned out to be Eins, but he was shooting for Chaplin, but he didn't realize who he shot. And then the third one is just that a couple of people were below deck. They had a gun. They sh- got in a fight. They shot through the roof of the deck and it, and it, it hit, hit Eins. It hit Eins. Right. Huh. So the DA eventually, so all this stuff doesn't add up. So finally the, the DA, the district attorney in that area, uh, finally had a, enough pressure on him to do an investigation, but his investigation only involved interviewing one person, and that was Dr. Goodman, excuse me, who uh, who took him off the boat. And so uh, he uh, did his investigation. He talked to Dr. Goodman. He pretty much explained the official story that I said to you, uh, except the other detail was that according to his story, once they got off the train uh, and wherever that location was, and they had the other doctor come in, um, uh, Eins had admitted to them that he had some alcohol on the yacht. Now, this was during the Prohibition era, which alcohol wasn't allowed. Right. So if the DA had continued his investigation, no matter what he found about the murder, whether you know, even if he found that Hearst was innocent – he still would have had to slap Hearst with a charge of bootlegging with the, and that was like, that was like a minor, it would be like going after a major powerful person for a parking ticket, yeah, you know, yeah, and okay. it would have been, there'd be a lot of proof in a lot. Of, right. Yeah, yeah. It would have turned out very ugly for him. So what's really interesting is to sort of see this Hearst power system and how it shut everything down. And to this day, we don't know. We just see all these, interesting facts that you know it doesn't add up and just just to kind of cap off the story dw griffith who's the one of the great early directors uh he said uh he said late in his life he said um if you ever want to see william randolph hearst turn white as a ghost all you have to do is mention uh thomas Eins's name wow very interesting. Okay, well, you got me going now. So, <laughs> so that's why huh. I uh, so that's why I mentioned all of the uh, old Hollywood stories because uh, I, I, maybe you found all this boring. I, I I I can imagine that. But for me, this is like like when I was researching a, a story. This is a really good story, and it was really fun and fascinating. So uh, when I said uh, the, the last movie in my Netflix queue that I was going to recommend is a movie called The Cat's Meow, with. Uh, Eddie Izzard and uh, Kristen Dunst and a few other people, which is actually an interpretation of what happened on the boat this night. Um, oh, so uh, that's worth checking out. I I I, uh, I started watching it, um, but I haven't had a chance to finish it. it. It's based on a play, and I, what I will say is it it really it's one of those movies that really feels like a play. It's sort of a stage that's sort of set up, and they sort of have a camera, so it's kind of a lot of dialogue and. Um, it's it's not fantastic, but if you like the story as much as I do, it's yeah, it's worth watching for me just to kind of follow up on that. And uh, so uh, yeah, uh, well, great story. Yeah, no, I would say anytime there can be anything like that, that's the history, and that it's that old, and there's this. I mean, because it's a mystery to this day. And right. so it's anybody's interpretation. And so if anybody's out there and you started snoring or anything, I feel bad for you because if you're listening <laughs> intently, uh, you'd realize that there is a potential for like this really great story there. And, uh, well, very interesting. As always, the uh, history lesson that I've learned, you know, if only you were my history teacher in school, I might have actually gotten a better grade. The 12A podcast is released every other Wednesday and distributed on the Four-Eyed Radio Network. To learn more about the podcast, check out 12aproductions.com.